in the book, but uh, I'm presenting the content of the book called Rethinking the Five Sole because the majority of outside of the land of Israel, the majority of the people in Messianic congregations are not Jewish. They're from Christian backgrounds and they have been like so many other Christians, very largely influenced by theological stances, doctrines that have been developed thousands of years ago. And they're not even aware necessarily that their beliefs are colored by those things. And sometimes it's okay, um, sometimes it's not. And um, we've been looking at the five sole because that, that is like the basis, the original basis for the Protestant movement. Um, the five sole being sola scriptura. See, get back to my list here. Um, so that I get it right. <clears throat> sola Scriptura, Sola Fide, Sola Gracia, Solus Christus, Soli Deo Gloria. And those statements mean Scripture alone, faith alone, grace alone, Christ alone, and glory to God alone. And we're basically dissecting these. Um, we're spending a lot of time on Sola Scriptura just simply because that is the basis for the other four. And we need to deal with that first in order to um, lay a good foundation to be able to deal with the other four that come after. We've basically gone through a series of messages where we pointed out the, the problems with uh, the belief sola scriptura and now so we dealt with it from a negative standpoint now we're starting to come at it from a positive side and that is talking about how very important um, community is in being able to interpret uh, the scripture and accurately apply uh, what we read in the scripture so we, this is a series that I've entitled Quinque Sole. Quinque Sole means the five sole. And this is part 13. I chose to use, that's a, obviously Latin. I chose to use Latin because um, concepts are delivered to us in Latin. So. even though this is a Messianic synagogue and English and Hebrew are mostly spoken here. So, Today's date is January 15th, 2022 on our calendar here in the United States. On the Hebrew calendar, Shalos Esrei Beshavat, Hamashim Besheva, Shmonim Beshtaim, 13th day of Shavat, 5782. And last Shabbat, I left us with a question. And I want to reiterate that question before we move on because we need to start obviously answering the question. And the question is, we, because what we had talked about last Shabbat was <clears throat> the problem with saying an absolute no to tradition and to community in order to interpret the scripture is that what that leaves everyone with is no foundation so and no anchor so everyone can interpret the scripture however they want to and that's exactly what has happened and that's the reason why we have 40,000 different Protestant denominations okay 
We also discovered that not necessarily, um, that it did not necessarily hold true that just because you ditch um, community and you ditch tradition, it's not always true that you have all the truth. So when we're talking about uh, you know, Catholicism, Judaism, Orthodox Christianity, they may not be as fractured as Protestant Christianity is, but they hold some beliefs that are not biblically accurate, okay? So, it, it, community is not foolproof, but it certainly keeps what has happened within Protestantism from happening, and that is all of the myriad aberrant interpretations and beliefs that have uh, been generated. And so the, the question that was asked at the end uh, last time was, is there a way of interpreting and applying the Bible that will more reliably bring us to the place where we can emulate the first century believers the community that was established by the Shlichim, the apostles, a place where we can be faithful to the teachings of Yeshua like His first followers were faithful. And so we want to start answering this question. And, you know, one of the things that I said last Shabbat was, you know, there are those who want to point to Messianic Judaism and say Messianic Judaism is the answer. I don't believe that. Um, I believe that Messianic Judaism is a step back in the right direction, a necessary step, uh, where I obviously believe in Messianic Judaism or I wouldn't be here doing what I'm doing. But I don't I don't believe in the perfection of Messianic Judaism. We have our own problems. We have our own aberrant uh, doctrines floating around out there that don't jive with what the Scripture says. So we're by no means perfect. We're just, like I said, a step back in the right direction. When Hashem comes to take His place in Jerusalem on the throne, He will teach the world exactly what we're supposed to do and we will all know from the least to the greatest and we will all have no excuse excuse for doing it wrong because he will make sure that we understand how we're supposed to do everything and until that point in time we're all struggling to try to figure out how to live out what the bible says and we don't always get it right the most noble person, the most caring person, the person who has the most intimate relationship with God and who wants the most desperately to serve God still gets things wrong because we're human beings. And, and that's going to actually play a big role in what I have to say today. Um, and, and by the end, I'm going to make some statements that are very, very important to be made and for us to understand because there, there is a, a, a mistaken belief that is held by so many believers in regards to the Word of God. And, and I want to make sure we all understand and, and know the truth, okay? That's always, you guys know, that's what I'm striving for all the time is I want myself and you to know the truth um, and and sometimes at great cost uh, to us so anyway so in order to answer this question we have to answer a bigger question and that is what is the bible now i'm not talking about what, what books make up the Bible, that we've already covered that in earlier messages, okay? We already talked about how 
really, there's no way for anybody to definitively say that these 66 books in, in what we have canonized are the only books that should be in there. We cannot definitively say none should be gone. We just know this is what we have been given, and I believe that it was given to us by God under the unction of the Holy Spirit. Okay? Um, and He has not left us without what we needed in order to live for Him the way that we need to live. And so I'm, I am comfortable, personally, I'm comfortable with the books that are in here. And I wouldn't go outside of this and, and personally, by myself, and that's what we're talking about here, say there are books that need to be taken out or there are books that need to be added. Okay, so um, I, this isn't an argument for, you know, what should be in the canon or not be in the canon. The question, what is the Bible, has to do with how do we perceive, as people, how do we perceive this book, okay? And it's very easy for us as believers to get caught in one, if you want to say, vortex, where we're just swirling around and around and around in the same place and with only one view without considering that there are other people outside of that vortex that have a different view than we have, okay? And sometimes it's not that their view is wrong and ours is right. It's just different, okay? But, but we can get so caught up in our own little world that we don't ever consider what other people say or think or the way that they see things. If I asked you, what is the Bible? Most of you would answer in, in some way like this. It is the revelation of God. And by the way, all of these things that I'm gonna be stating are true, okay? Um, but, but we need to, the reason I'm bringing this up is we need to look maybe uh, differently. So it is the revelation of God. Yes, it is. It is the Word of God or the words from God. We can say yes. It represents God's will for His people. I think we can agree for that, with that. It is our manual for faith and practice. So all of these are true statements. These are the kind of statements that you would hear from most believers if you ask them, what is the Bible? But to other people, uh, whether they be consider themselves Christian or not, um, they may look at the Bible in a very different way than that, okay? and they may give different, a different answer uh, to that question. And where I want to focus is on historical, the historical scholars, okay? We just encountered basically a historical scholar, a textual scholar um, in Dr. Elior, okay? She had her own opinions on what the Bible is, you know, what it says, why it was canonized, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. and we discussed that. But historical scholars would say that it's a, a, a an historical document, and again, they're they're not wrong by saying it's a historical document. Okay. Now, if we want to reduce it down to just an historical document, then I have a problem with that, obviously, because I believe that it is was given by God to us. But I want to read, I want to read an excerpt here in regards to historical scholarship. <clears throat> Today nearly all serious academic encounters with the Bible 
are based on the historical critical method, even those undertaken by believers. As a result, believing scholars must hold in tension the idea that the Bible they are studying is God's Word with the idea that the Bible is a very human document subject to layers of revision and editing by the community that initially produced it, thus finding its only authoritative interpretation within that community, the community to which the human authors and audiences belonged. I want to, you know, I earlier I, I said we're human beings, and so even the most sincere is still going to get things wrong. The Bible, what we have as the Bible, in my estimation, is definitely, was definitely inspired by God. The authors were inspired by the Ruach HaKodesh to write what they wrote and to present that to everyone, you know, initially to Israel, um, to Israel alone, and then eventually it would end up coming to all of the rest of the world. But I believe that it was inspired by the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit, for these men to write. Were they perfect human beings when they wrote? No, they were not. And we've talked on more than one occasion, you know, in some of the writings of Rav Shaul, he actually makes the statement in one book, and I don't remember which it is, someone may, may recall, makes the statement, this is my opinion. Okay? Not... Not this is the word of God, but this is my opinion. Okay, so we're dealing with a book that has been inspired by the Ruach HaKodesh, but has been filtered basically through people, through individuals who are not themselves perfect human beings. Okay, and that is that's a very important thing for us to. Keep in mind, now there, there has been for quite some time a controversy called the fundamentalist modernist, modernist controversy that's been going on in the body. And the modernists want to bring us, in their estimation, uh, into the modern age. Okay? So they want to do things like um, accept homosexuality and um, not just make statements of acceptance, but actually to do things like um, install homosexual leaders in their congregations and uh, so on and so forth. Um, that is a very progressive or modernistic view. Um, what, what the attempt is, is to try to shape, in essence, the Bible, shape the Bible to fit society, okay? To, to basically go along with what is going on uh, in the world around us. The fundamentalists, on the other hand, take the opposite approach and they say, no, the word, the scripture is unchanging. It doesn't matter what goes on around us, how much that changes, this stays the same. And of course, this congregation would obviously fall within the boundaries of fundamentalists, okay? That has become a dirty word, um, uh, at least in this country. Um, if you're considered a, a fundamentalist as far as the Bible is re, uh, concerned. But fundamentalists, but by and large, reject the historical critical method um, of determination of the Scripture, and rightfully so. I'm, I'm, I'm just giving to you 
but there's this controversy between these two sides and they see it diff very differently. Um, and so I want to go back to um, an excerpt here and then I want to delve into something that, that to me is extremely important for us to understand. But let me, let me read this here. So as I said, fundamentalists reject the historical critical method. As a result, many modern readers of the Bible fail to benefit, as believing scholars also do, from seeing the tension between the Bible as God's authoritative word and the Bible as an inseparable part of the community that produced it. However, to move beyond the unworkable paradigm of sola scriptura, committed conservative Protestants must begin to see the Bible as more than a divine document that reflects God's inviolable testimony about himself and the world he created, not less than, but more than. They must begin to see the Bible also as a product, product and a function of the community with which God maintains and has historically maintained a unique relationship, the Jewish people. Okay? This all began, as you well know, with the Jewish people. Rav Shaul reiterates this on more than one occasion the importance of the Jewish people in this whole thing. Because even at that point in time, in the first century, there was beginning this dissension among the non-Jewish people within the body that they were just as important. They as the grafted in branches were just as important as the natural branches. And Rav Shaul had to basically admonish them in Romans, be careful where you're headed with this. Because if Hashem had the ability to remove the natural branches from the tree, He has every ability, even though He's grafted you in, to remove, remove you as well, if you in your pride elevate yourself over the natural branches. Okay? So that was already beginning to happen, and Rav Shaul had to address that on more than one occasion and had to emphasize because he was the quote-unquote uh, shaliach or apostle to the Gentiles. Okay, He was the one that was sent out by Hashem to the remote areas into the predominantly non-Jewish held communities where he established congregations. And so we, we end up looking at our circumstance here in modern day Messianic Judaism as, you know, Messianic Judaism itself at the kernel there's a great deal of people that are filled with consternation over how many non-Jewish people are involved in Messianic Judaism. And there are some that go so far as to say they don't want uh, non-Jewish people involved. Okay, I've encountered those people. To me, that is antithetical to what the Word of God says. Okay, The whole purpose of me as a as a descendant of Abraham, Yitzchak, and Yaakov, is to teach the nations how to worship Hashem. And so if I want to take all of you who are non-Jewish and tell you, get out of here, I don't want you here, then how can I fulfill my role? Okay? So this isn't a Jewish-only club, Messianic Judaism. But we're not the first to deal with this. This is what they were dealing with in the first century. Is all, all of these Jewish people are like, what? 
What is going on? We got all these non-Jewish people wanting to come in and be a part of what we're doing. How do we handle them? What do we do with them? And so th this is not new. And, and Hashem is not taken aback by what is going on. This is part of His plan. This is the renewal, the restoration in progress, okay? But we, as what has to happen for non-Jewish believers in Yeshua, what has to happen is they have to begin to understand and we can't make this happen. The Holy Spirit has to do this. It's not like we should go out and preach in churches what I'm about to say. But the believers have to begin understanding that there is a very specific process that Hashem started and He wanted it done in a very particular way. And we have to get on board with His way of doing things we can't pick and choose how things are going to go. He's the one in charge. He started with the people of Israel. His intent was to build His kingdom starting with the people of Israel. And if we then turn around as non-Jewish people and reject the people of Israel and reject everything that they present, then we, as the old saying goes, We've cut our nose off to spite our face. So there has to be an understanding of what Hashem is trying to do here, not fighting against it, but, but joining with Him in the process of bringing the restoration that He's wanting to bring. Now this leads me to this last main point that I want to make. We must not, and, and I'm going to flesh this out, so just hang in there with me. We must not elevate the scriptures to God-like status. I'm going to say that again. We must not elevate the scriptures to God-like status. We do a lot here to show our reverence and our honor for the Word of God. What we did, you know, when we paraded the Torah through the congregation, we reach out, we touch the Torah, we bring our fingers to our lips, we turn and face the Torah so we're not turning our back on the Torah. When we put it back. You see us take three steps back and bow. We're, we're doing all of these things to show our reverence for the Word of God. And here I am using a term that I'm going to kind of teach against, but it's so inculcated in everything that we have learned and everything that we do. Uh, <clears throat> but We want to show respect and reverence for the Scriptures, for the Bible, because it was inspired by the Ruach HaKodesh. It was given to us. It does proclaim the character, nature, essence, and reputation of Hashem. But we do not worship it. Okay? It's not something to be worshipped. And, and this may seem like a, well, no duh, okay? But, all right, I want to ask a question. In my own experience growing up, so even as a child, unlearned, untaught, really, there were things that I was taught by my teachers about the Bible or from the Bible that just did not make sense to me. And when I would go to my teachers and ask them, 
about whatever it was. They would either give some canned, flippant answer that didn't help, or they wouldn't want to talk about it because maybe they didn't actually know the answer themselves. It's just that's what they were taught to teach others, okay? Or they felt like maybe you're too young, uh, you're not going to understand if I tell you the answer, or whatever the reason was, we did not get answers that satisfied us, okay? You guys that have been around for a long enough time know that I am a person who readily admits that I don't know everything. And that if you ask me a question and I don't know the answer to it, I don't try to pretend that I do. I tell you, I'm sorry, I don't know the answer to that question. And maybe it's something that we can study and look at and, and discover the answer. Um, I, I try my best not to put on any kind of pretenses or, you know, I know that there are a lot of religious leaders who do. A lot of religious leaders who think that somehow because they're in the field as a clergyman that somehow they're better, higher than other people and they act that way. In my estimation, you know, there, there are some who choose to go into religious leadership as a career. I don't know why you would want to do that, personally. But they go into it as a career. And they may get some big mega church and make lots of money and so on. Um, then there are others who like just go into it because they don't know what else to do. It's just a job. You know, um, but the ones who really genuinely are called to do this, the reluctant leaders, we know that we are just humans like you. We were asked to do a job just as if our boss was to ask us to clean a building or work on a car or do something else. We were asked to do this. And so, if we really want to follow Hashem, we try to do the best that we can at our job. But we don't know everything. In fact, the longer I go, the more shocked at how much I don't know. And um, so anyway, um, when it comes to teaching the Word of God, if I, if I were to ask you, um, is Yeshua and the Bible, are they one and the same? You would say, no, absolutely not, okay? But then we turn around and we use terminology like Yeshua is the living Torah, okay? What does that mean? Does, does that mean that a Torah scroll somewhere like magically turned into Yeshua? No, obviously. But what do we mean when we say that Yeshua is the living Torah? What we mean is that the Torah expresses to us as human beings the character, nature, essence, and reputation of Hashem and that Yeshua embodies that character, nature, essence, and reputation. In fact, the scripture tells us that the fullness of the Godhead, whatever that means, dwells in Yeshua in bodily form, okay? So he physically was the expression in a physical human form of the essence of who God is, okay? It doesn't mean that the words in this book turned into a human being. 
So let us deal with a passage. See, a lot of times what ends up happening is a teacher may not outright teach a thing, but they will end up communicating a thought or a belief like in the waters underneath, okay? So it's not on the surface where you can see it, but it kind of ends up getting communicated anyway, like between the lines, okay? So I want us to go to Yochanan, John, chapter 1, verses 1 through 5, okay? Page 1329 in the Complete Jewish Bible and 1518 in the Study Bible. For those of you who know the Bible, you'll know immediately where, what I'm dealing with. <clears throat> In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. All things came to be through Him, and without Him nothing made had being. In Him was life, and the life was the light of mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not suppressed it. Here's what I want to point out. In the first two verses, it uses this term, word, three times. In the beginning was the word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. One of the things that we end up doing, and I told you earlier, it's just, it's so inculcated in our culture that we say it without even thinking. We call this the Word of God, okay? It probably would be better if we would say the words of God, okay? That's closer, maybe, okay? But when we say the Word of God, what ends up happening is there ends up being a confusion, a blending of concepts, okay? So, if I were to retranslate this and, and read it, in the beginning was the Bible, and the Bible was with God, and the Bible was God, would that be an, would that be an accurate statement? Absolutely not. Okay? But there is this underlying idea that somehow Yeshua as the Word, in Greek, Logos, and in Hebrew, memoir, that somehow there's this, and especially with the, um, the whole idea of him being the living Torah and all that kind of stuff, that there's like this melding between the Bible and Yeshua. Folks, there's no melding, okay? Certainly, it's inspired, and it reveals, as I said, the character, nature, essence, and reputation of Hashem, but it is not Him. It's only about Him. And to take this, which some do, unfortunately, I don't know if you really press them into a corner and you, and you ask them, what they really believed, I'm not sure what they would tell you, but they so revere this book that they elevate it to almost equality with God Himself. And it's important for us to understand that if we do that with this book, 
It is no different than what Aharon did with the gold in making the golden calf and telling the people of Israel, here is your God that led you out of Egypt. Okay? Folks, this, we need to respect this book. I, I'm personally of the opinion. I, I hate to see it when people put their Bible on the floor. I'll tell you that. Okay? N not that I'm going to say anything to you. It just bugs the you-know-what out of me. Okay? Put your Bible on the floor. I also, whenever I have my Bible out, I don't lay other books or papers or anything else on top of my Bible. It's always on the top. Okay? I try my best to revere the Word of God because I believe, here it is, so the Word of God, the words of God, because I believe it to be holy. I, I respect it. I give it all. But this is not God. It's not a thing to be worshipped. It is a book. It is words on paper. It communicates ideas, thoughts, concepts to us. It communi communicates who God is and what He's like to us so that we can know. It teaches us what we need to know in order to live for Him. But we have to understand that as inspired as this is, it was written by people. And not make this into an idol itself. Okay? Whether in this form or that scroll in the our own Kodesh or whatever. You know, in a in a in a synagogue, if a scroll is inadvertently dropped on the ground, on the floor, the entire synagogue goes into mourning and fasting for 40 days. That's why when we are handling the Torah, we're careful in the handling not to let it slip, not, it, not to let it get out of our control. That's why we have somebody who stands here to help us lay it down and pick it up and so on. We don't want it to drop on the floor. But it is not of equal value or place as Hashem Himself. And I don't know what kind of background you came from. You may have come from one of these backgrounds where, you know, if you, like I said, if you backed them in a the corner, if you, if you were to ask them point blank, do you believe the Bible is as special or elevated or whatever as God, they would, I'm sure they would say no. But their actions belie something else. Usually it's the people who absolutely insist, it's the same people who absolutely insist in only using the 1611 King James Version Bible only. And we cannot do this with what we have. We have to have a balanced approach and understanding of what this book is and know that human beings were involved, flawed human beings were involved in writing this. Who did their best and were inspired by the Holy Spirit to, do, to write what they wrote. Okay? Because as we go forward in this teaching, this is something that we have to keep in mind because there are going to be some concepts that are brought forth that maybe because of your background and the way you were taught might be difficult to handle when we start dealing with the Scripture. Okay? Yes. I like to think it's just like God's little finger. And it's just like letters I've received from my husband as far as take care of him 
I keep them, I guard them, I reread them, but they're not my husband. Right. They're just his thoughts yes. for me. And I internalize that and I make this quite hurt. It's to me. You know, yeah. Thought. Yeah. Uh, for those of you who are watching on the live stream, she was likening the Bible to a love letter from her husband. And, you know, she may cherish those letters. She may bring those letters out and reread them. And, and those letters express how he feels about her and so on. But she understands those letters are not him. The letters are not her husband. They are from him and about him, but they are not him. And so... It's just important, I, I, I know for some of you, you're probably going, well, you didn't have to say all this, we understand all of this, but no, there really is some deep thing that ends up being communicated so often in congregations that somehow this has such a place of elevation that it almost is equivalent to God himself. We can't do that with this, okay? It is a book, okay? A book about God. A book that he made sure that we had so that we would know about him, okay? Yes. I'm sorry to do this, but it's gonna probably muddy the water a little more. One of the things that also makes it a little more confusing is the fact that when God speaks, things manifest. So the idea that these are the words of God, there is this interesting thing. What, what we're dealing with right now is actually something that's very hard for us to define. It's sort of, I, I, what my mind went to was, this is like when we say that Yeshua is equal to, but yet submissive to the Father. Can we fully get it? No, not really. The fact that, and the fact that why we we are made in the image of God. So the idea is that words for us, life and death, are there. So what God had to say have importance because there's power there. But, once again, is the word itself the power, or is it because of where it stems from, just like our concepts of light? God is light, but does that mean every ray of light is God? No. It is that which comes from Him. So, I know, like I said, that kind of muddies the concept a little more because of the idea of the, you know, he speaks and things become what he says, basically. Um, but uh, it, it's just, this one's just a really hard one to define. And uh, one of the things I do want to say is a lot of people want to say the whole thing about this was a book writ written by men as a way to disparage it. And I know, I know my father, that's not what he's doing. A good way to look at this is God does not want to bring forth anything in the world. He does sometimes, but he doesn't want to bring, up, bring anything into the world without the joining of his beloved with him in bringing it forth. So when we say that this has been written by men, and because of it there is that we are flawed, it is not flawed from the standpoint of God is doing it the way he wants to do it, which is the the joining of man with God to bring something into the world. This book is a epitome of that. He brought forth this book through man and him working together. And that's exactly how he wanted it. That's exactly uh, how he planned it. So from that standpoint, it's perfect in how it's been built. That said, we have gotten a long way from the source. <laughs> and we've had, it's not just one flawed man with the perfection of God. If we had that, we'd be at a, actually a lot better place. It's the perfection of God with one man, and then another man trying to translate that, and then another man trying to translate that, and then another man trying to translate that, and the continuation from there. So the further we get, the more we can question how much of this is what came from the pure. So, um, but it is pure when it comes to it is what God wanted to do with man. He wanted to bring forth his word through man. So.
I agree. All right. Let's pray. Hmm. How about we just wrap all of this up and give it to you to use in the lives and the hearts and the minds of the people who hear it as you see fit, Lord God. Teach us what we need to know. Help us to understand, to have a real, true understanding of you, of your word, of what you expect of us, how you want us to live, how you want us to apply what is written in this book. In Yeshua's name, amen.